Hello, good evening. Good evening. Hello, Milton. How are you? How how you been doing? <laughs> okay, very good. Uh good evening, Milton. Good evening, Sirhan. Good evening, teacher. Okay, how are you, Sirhan? Fine, fine. It's fine. This, this day is very, very, very cool. Okay, it was really good. Glad to hear that. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see you again. And uh, I don't know if you have been practicing with uh, the reading or with the listening during the week or during the weekend. Uh, only listening. Only listening. It was difficult for you, the listening, or is it is it easier than the reading? For me, listening is more or less. More or less. More or less. Okay, very good. So that's why we're going to practice. Let's see, Marielos, good evening. How are you, Marielos? Good evening. Oh, fine, thank you. Okay, I'm How glad to you? hear that. Ah, oh, I'm okay. Thank you for asking. Okay. It's kind of uh, I was a uh, kind of tiring day, but it was it was good, right? It was okay. good. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <thanks. laughs> okay, very good. Let's see who else is in the class. Katya Maritza, good evening. And Lady Diana, good evening. Okay, thank you for being on time. Thank good you for evening. good evening. Okay, we are going to continue with the listening practice today. Uh, how did you feel yesterday? Uh, the practice. It was easy. It was difficult. It was difficult too. <laughs> it was difficult. <laughs> okay. Okay. We are going to uh have some practice today. Today, yesterday, we listened to a conversation right but uh today we are going to listen to a lecture like a class right so we are going to listen to information related to something like we are receiving a class in english and we are to we are going to answer some questions okay so we are going to begin with that let's see thank you for coming sarah martinez good evening uh katya Hi, teacher good evening good evening okay perfect Katya, how do you feel the practice of yesterday, yesterday's practice? It was good, it was easy, difficult? I think it was easier than the reading practice. I prefer listening. Yes, right, because you don't have to read like in a rush. You just listen, and if you understand, you understand, right? And if you don't understand, you guess, right? You can guess, and you can uh, catch the general idea. Yeah, it's it's better, it's easier, probably. So we are going to start the practice today. We are going to review some of the tips uh, that we had yesterday. And let me see here. <coughs> it seems that somebody sure. was, yes? Uh, can you share the, the tip, please? Where the, in the what group? Sorry? Uh, can you share the tips in the WhatsApp group, please? These tips or which ones? The tips about listening. Yes, yes, I will share. Uh, uh, today, I, I just shared the, the reading tips and the information, but I will share these ones also, okay? So no problem. Okay. I will okay. I will give you that information. Uh, today, also, somebody was asking about the speaking, right? Because next week, we will have speaking, right? We are going to speak oh. a lot. And some someone was asking about this section already. And this section, you will listen some information and then you can prepare yourself, right? So for example, it says some research, research has indicated that pets are important for a per person's mental health. Do you agree? or disagree, explain your point of view, include details and examples to support your explanation. 
the preparation time, you have 15 seconds, right? To think what you're going to say. And the response times uh, will be 45 seconds. And if you play this, uh, you will see, you will listen that um, it says after the beep, you can record your response. But obviously here you are not able to record, right? Any response. So what you, and somebody was asking me, uh, do we need to send this response to the WhatsApp in a voice note, something like that? And I said, no, you can prepare your response. And next week we are going to start speaking and we are going to do these exercises, okay? So probably in the first class or second class, you can read this information and you can start speaking and talking about your point of view. So uh, this, this is what we are going to do. So if you are if you are in the speaking part in the section three, speaking, you can do that. You can listen to this, you can read the information and you can uh, prepare yourself during the weekend, right? So you don't have to send any voice note or anything. Okay, do okay. you have any? Okay, very good. Okay, do you have any? The same question. Okay. <laughs> uh, you had the same question. Okay, yes. very good. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so you just need to prepare yourselves and, and next week we are going to start. Okay, okay I thought that we have to to uh, um, record I, uh, um, about the answer. <laughs> yes. That, uh, about in, in the WhatsApp group or on another WhatsApp? Or no, only no. Practice in the class. Just practice in the class. Ah, uh, for okay. example, you, you read here. And let's say uh, tomorrow is going to be Monday. We are going to start with the speaking section. So I will prepare myself. I will read this information. And then you will share your point of view during the class, okay. right? So, yes, I can give you feedback it's in that cool. way. It's good yeah. because, uh, because you can, um, uh, can do uh, mm -hmm. uh, ask about that in the, in the class. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and you can, um, uh, I don't know, show our mistakes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, exactly. Maybe. I can give you some feedback uh, after okay. you share your point of view or you start speaking. I can give you that information. So if you are in the speaking part, you can do that during the weekend, right? And let's see here. So we are going to review a little bit of yesterday's information. These are the tips that we were talking about yesterday. It was, we were talking about practicing with an audio, audio that has a transcript, even if it is something that we can enjoy. Uh, you can look for information with the pages that I already provided you. Track your progress with a journal, write the words you learn each day. Building a skill takes some time. Don't try to understand everything. You have to understand the most important parts of the information. Listen for the main idea. Don't rely on your eyes, right? Listening is like talking on the phone. You'll, you'll only have the voice. Don't take bad notes. So we are going today about bad, uh, notes, right? Taking notes. Focus on your notes. Don't write anything. Only important parts of the listening. Write verbs and nouns. Skip prepositions, articles, pronouns. Uh, for example, this is uh, an example. I went to the store. Went store, right? If you if you understand uh, your writing or your notes, you can do it in that way. Don't write the main idea. Listen to the whole listening practice. Sometimes the main idea is not a sentence or a word. And then think like a student and think about the information you are given and why. So we are going to talk about that uh, today about taking notes. This is just an advice, as I already told you yesterday. If you believe that um, you don't want to take notes or it's difficult for you, or if you feel better not taking notes, it's okay, you can do it. But this is just a recommendation, right? So do I have to take notes? It depends on you, right? Some people, uh, as I already told you, can say, I can't take notes and listen at the same time. Or if I take notes, then I might miss part of the passage. Or I don't know what I should write down on my notes, writing my notes. So how can I do it, right? 
So first of all, we are going to write down mostly nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So prepositions, no. Prepositions in, in, at, from, by, no. Articles, a and d. Auxiliary verbs, models, conjunctions, pronouns, and demonstratives. So we can avoid those kind of words. We need to worry about content words, right? Nouns like cat, table, school, adjectives, lazy, wooden, big, adverbs, quickly, suddenly, timely, and main verbs, jump, shake, and listen. And this is an example as we were uh, checking yesterday. For example, uh, since the 1980s, it says meteorite finds in the Antarctic have dramatically increased our knowledge of space and its materials. So if we avoid these uh, words, which this, these are not content words, it is shorter, right? 1980s meteorite finds Antarctic dramatically increased in knowledge space material. Also uh, vowels and consonants, right? These are vowels and these are consonants, right? So sometimes we can write only, um, some people do this, right? Some people, I don't do it actually. I just write kind of, of the words and I understand uh, how I write. If I write really, really fast, I can understand my, my handwriting, right? But some people uh, just write uh, consonants like this one is meteorite, pines. And uh, this is uh, Antarctic, dramatically, increase and so on, right? So that is just a recommendation for you to uh, write faster. It's just a recommendation, but if you want to write the whole word, uh, it's okay. So five rules for not taking. Number one, write down mostly nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Number two, write down mostly consonants if it is possible for you. If not, just write the, the whole word. And Number three, know your core symbols. What is a core, core symbol? This is a symbol, right? And instead of uh, writing a word, you can write a symbol. For example, if I say, I love hamburgers, instead of saying or writing love, I can write a heart, right? So it's kind of the same, right? For example, if it is a positive symbol, the meaning can be benefit, positive also. If it is this symbol, can mean not, no, negative, stop. This is, can be a question, right, or I'm not sure. This can be rise, increase, improve. This can mean go down, decrease, problematic. Leads, results, and follow. This one is equal or is the same or similar to something. And this one is not equal, not the same or dissimilar. So these are just core symbols that you can use when taking notes. Instead of writing, um a, a word right this can um this can you can uh, write like an idea with these symbols mm -hmm. so number three know your core symbols number four include seven words or less per line number five indent when two pieces of information are connected okay so this was the listening that we had yesterday do you, do you remember the listening what was the listening about ¿De qué era la, la, la conversación? Do you remember that? The, yes. It was about yes. Hamlet. It's the Hamlet. <laughs> yeah. William Shakespeare. He went about, about Hamlet, Hamlet. And when a student spoke with his teacher about the, about the book, and because he presented it, uh, I see a different scene. Over to that. Yes, exactly. So he, she thought that she wanted to audition for the play, but um, we are going to, yesterday we did this. For some of you was easy, for some of you was kind of difficult. But these are the questions, and we already answered this question, right? 
And also these are the question types. Remember that it's not necessary to remember or to identify all the questions like, is this a GIST content or this is a GIST purpose or this is a detailed question? No, it, it is better for you to understand the listening part and then try to understand the question and try to write the correct information, right? We have eight different types of questions, like understanding the function, making inferences, understanding organization, connecting contents, uh, but it, that is not that important, okay? So five simple rules uh, with GIST content and GIST purpose, because these are one of the com most common uh, questions and they are kind of similar. So for example, what is the professor mainly discussing? Is that a GIST content or a GIST purpose question? What is the professor mainly discussing? What is that? That is a purpose question. It's a purpose question or it's a GIST content question? Let's see. GIST, GIST content. content. GIST yeah. content. Remember, GIST content is like what is the lecture mainly about or what was what problem oh. does the man have, right? So it's a GIST content, right? And the purpose, they will ask you for a purpose, right? Why does the student visit the professor or why does the professor mention this? That is a purpose, right? So this will be um, content. We have other two here. Why does the student go to the career center? That is a GIST purpose question. What is the purpose for the student to go to the career center? And we have another one. Why do the professor and the student mainly discuss? That is a GIST content question, okay? Because it's talking about the general uh, topic of the discussion. And we have other two here, uh, detailed questions, right? Detailed questions are straightforward and often use uh, what? For example, according to the lecture, what is an example of the effects or climate change? So that is a detailed question. It's asking you about a specific detail or which one of the following is an indicator that you might suffer from sleep debt. So this one is with which, even if it is with, with which is a detailed question. And what is the professor mainly discussing? This is a content question or a detailed question? What is that question, content or detail? Content. Detail. Content, right? Content. It's a content, content question, question. Okay. content question, very good. So detail is this one. What does the professor say about shooting star? So it's very specific, right? About shooting star, not in general, right? Uh, which one of the following is an indicator that you might suffer from sleep debt? So that is detail. And another content question is, what is the professor mainly discussing? So it's more general, right? It's more general. Okay. These ones are connecting content questions. So you will see a table and you will see an, a question mm -hmm. like this. The professor discusses several causes and effects of climate change indicate which information matches a cause or effect. And you will have to um, fill the chart, right? You will have to complete the chart. This is a connecting content. So you will have to create or, or fill up with the information that you listen to it. This question is worth two points because it's kind of long. So, and a question wording. Uh, these one are kind of uh, similar inference and connecting content. For example, what does the professor imply about this? And if you can see here, what can be inferred about this, right? Or what can be inferred about this? What does the professor imply about this? So it's, sometimes it's kind of difficult to understand which one is inference or connecting content. So we have a uh, different um, five simple rules about questions, just content, just purpose question. So they come first, they come at the beginning of the test. Just purpose questions will ask why. Detailed questions are straightforward and often use uh, what. Connecting content questions are often tables understanding the function, understanding the speaker's editor and making inference will ask you infer or imply or why. 
So for the 12 listening question, the most important thing to consider is whether the information was stated directly or if you have to make an inference. Do not worry about identifying the specific question type. So it can be, just need to uh, pay attention into that information. If it is something general, or if you need to infer about that, or if it is stated directly, if they are, are saying that, because sometimes they won't say that information and you will have an inference, okay? Infer inference questions are like this, right? What do you think the student is most likely to do next? Probably they don't mention this, but you have to infer this. So that is kind of difficult. In this case, you just need to answer the question. Do not worry about identifying the question type name. Just be sure you can tell the difference between something directly and an inference. Okay, do you have any questions about what, about the information that I just provided you? Questions, preguntas? No, no question. No, 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 no. Okay. Are you ready to practice today? The listening part? Yes, yes. right. Yes. yes. Okay. First of all, we are going to have lectures, okay? No conversations, lectures, okay? <clears throat> we are going to have uh, this practice. It's about Sylvia, Sylvia Plath. So let me see here. We are not going to see the questions, okay? No vamos a ver las preguntas. Just the listening, okay? And then we are going to, I will give you one minute for you to answer these questions. Let me see here. I guess this is the practice. Okay, it says in this section, you will hear academic lectures. In the exam, you will hear each lecture once before you look at the question. So you, they will play just once. If you want to, because this is the second day, I will play it twice, but you let me know, okay? At the end, you will let me know if you want it to listen to it again. In this practice test, you can control the audio yourself. You can see the script of the conversation. So I will I'll give you this link for you to practice more, but right now we are going to listen just a lecture. This lecture is about the poet, Sylvia Plath. Take notes while you listen, then answer the questions. Read all the questions before you start listening. You should listen to the audio twice, but right now we are just going to listen, okay? Listen, take notes, and then we are going to read the questions, okay? Okay, let me know if you are able to listen, okay? Today, we're going to look at the life and some of the works of one of America. You can listen? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Okay, I will, I will start again. I will start again. And we are going to listen to it, okay? Going to look at the life and some of the works of one of America's finest modern female poets, Sylvia Plath. At the time of her death in 1963, Sylvia Blath was on the verge of the critical success and recognition that she had sought for most of her life. Her first novel, The Bell Jar, had just been published, and the publication of her collection of poems, Ariel, had just been agreed. These poems, which were mostly written during the last year of her life, chronicle the traumatic developments taking place in her personal life and were to make for her a reputation as a first-rate poet. But it wasn't until 1982, almost 20 years after her death, that her posthumously published Collected Poems won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. Since this time, the fascination and intrigue with her work has continued to grow. Very few modern poets have captured the popular imagination as much as Plath, even to the extent that in 2003, a movie was made about her life and her intense relationship with husband and fellow poet Ted Hughes. To understand the continued growth in interest in her work, we have to look at the issues which her life and work address. As Susan Basnett writes in her book on women writers, dying as she did in 1963, Sylvia Plath never knew that so soon afterwards the problems of what and how women write was to become such a crucial matter and was to be debated by so many other women. So Sylvia Plath was a woman writing about women's issues before they were recognized as being of any importance. 
Sylvia Plath was born in Robinson Memorial Hospital in Boston, October 27, 1932. She was the firstborn child of Otto and Aurelia Plath, both highly educated academic people. Her father, Otto, was a professor of biology at Boston University, but her mother had been subjugated into a domestic role as housewife, despite her level of education. Her father was not too pleased with the birth of his daughter and demanded that his wife have a son within the next two years. Amazingly enough, his wife obliged by giving birth to a son almost exactly two years later. This domineering father figure became a common theme that recurred throughout Plath's writing. With the birth of her brother, Sylvia had to work much harder to win her father's attention and approval. When in 1936 Plath's father became ill, access to him became even more restricted, and Plath's main means of getting attention from her father was by achieving academic success. This meant that from an early age she began to equate love with success. In 1940, Plath's father died, and this left the family in a very difficult financial situation. They were forced to move away from the seaside home that Plath had enjoyed so much and into a suburb of Boston, and her mother had to take a part-time job to support the family. In 1950, Plath graduated from Bradford High School and won a scholarship to Smith College. In the same year, she published a short story entitled, And Summer Will Not Come Again and a poem called Bitter Strawberries. Plath's time at Smith was difficult as she had very high expectations of herself. She wanted to achieve immaculate grades, but she also wanted to be accepted by her peers, and an important part of being accepted was being popular and dating lots of boys. This was difficult because as a scholarship girl, she only had a very small allowance to spend on clothes and going out, and each year's continued scholarship was dependent on the level of her grades. In 1953, Plath won a fiction contest sponsored by Mademoiselle magazine and was offered the opportunity to go to New York as a guest editor. She relished this opportunity to spend a month working in a professional publishing environment. But Plath returned from New York feeling exhausted, and after hearing news that her application to a creative writing course had been rejected, she fell into what was to become one of her many depressions. Today we're going to look at the life and some of the works. Okay, did you take notes? Or do you want to listen to it again? Yes, right. <laughs> 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 I love it. A lot you of have fun with us, teacher. <laughs> Two or three times <laughs> more. No, I'm not having fun, but for that reason I'm asking you, right? Because on Thursday, we are, we are going to have like a practice and it's going to be time. So today I will give you the time that you need, right? If you want to listen to it again, we are going yeah. to listen to it again, right? But uh, on, probably on Thursday, we are going to have another practice. And this practice will be... I will be without just... Without repetition. Without repetition and also with, with time for answers, okay? Okay. I will play it again. I will play it again. Okay, so I'll listen <laughs> no, to it. Okay, teacher. <laughs> no, teacher. It was cute. no, 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 no. Okay, now we're going to play it right now. Today, we're going to look at the life and some of the works of one of America's finest modern female poets, Sylvia Plath. At the time of her death in 1963, Sylvia Plath was on the verge of the critical success and recognition that she had sought for most of her life. Her first novel, The Bell Jar, had just been published, and the publication of her collection of poems, Ariel, had just been agreed. These poems, which were mostly written during the last year of her life, chronicle the traumatic developments taking place in her personal life and were to make for her a reputation as a first-rate poet. But it wasn't until 1982, almost 20 years after her death, that her posthumously published Collected Poems won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. Since this time, the fascination and intrigue with her work has continued to grow. Very few modern poets have captured the popular imagination as much as Plath, even to the extent that in 2003, a movie was made about her life and her intense relationship with husband and fellow poet Ted Hughes. 
To understand the continued growth in interest in her work, we have to look at the issues which her life and work address. As Susan Bassnett writes in her book on women writers, dying as she did in 1963, Sylvia Plath never knew that so soon afterwards the problems of what and how women write was to become such a crucial matter and was to be debated by so many other women. So Sylvia Plath was a woman writing about women's issues before they were recognized as being of any importance. Sylvia Plath was born in Robinson Memorial Hospital in Boston, October 27, 1932. She was the first-born child of Otto and Aurelia Plath, both highly educated academic people. Her father, Otto, was a professor of biology at Boston University, but her mother had been subjugated into a domestic role as housewife, despite her level of education. Her father was not too pleased with the birth of his daughter and demanded that his wife have a son within the next two years. Amazingly enough, his wife obliged by giving birth to a son almost exactly two years later. This domineering father figure became a common theme that recurred throughout Plath's writing. With the birth of her brother, Sylvia had to work much harder to win her father's attention and approval. When in 1936 Plath's father became ill, access to him became even more restricted, and Plath's main means of getting attention from her father was by achieving academic success. This meant that from an early age she began to equate love with success. In 1940, Plath's father died, and this left the family in a very difficult financial situation. They were forced to move away from the seaside home that Plath had enjoyed so much and into a suburb of Boston, and her mother had to take a part-time job to support the family. In 1950, Plath graduated from Bradford High School and won a scholarship to Smith College. In the same year, she published a short story entitled, And Summer Will Not Come Again and a poem called Bitter Strawberries. Plath's time at Smith was difficult as she had very high expectations of herself. She wanted to achieve immaculate grades, but she also wanted to be accepted by her peers, and an important part of being accepted was being popular and dating lots of boys. This was difficult because as a scholarship girl, she only had a very small allowance to spend on clothes and going out, and each year's continued scholarship was dependent on the level of her grades. In 1953, Plath won a fiction contest sponsored by Mademoiselle magazine and was offered the opportunity to go to New York as a guest editor. She relished this opportunity to spend a month working in a professional publishing environment. But Plath returned from New York feeling exhausted, and after hearing news that her application to a creative writing course had been rejected, she fell into what was to become one of her many depressions. Today, we're Okay, that's it. It was easy or difficult? Easy, right? Easy. Difficult. Easy. <laughs> difficult. More or less. More or less. More easy or less. for you, teacher. Yeah. No. Actually, these yeah. tests, these are not normal tests, right? This is the TOEFL. It's kind of tough. So we are going to answer the questions. So I will read the questions and you will choose one option. And at the end, as yesterday, we are going to try to answer the questions. Okay, now we are going to, uh, yes, the bell jar was, okay, this is the practice number one, right? So the first question is, the bell jar was about her father, her first novel, novel. a very successful collection of poems, or her last poem? Choose one option, don't say anything, please. Choose one option. <laughs> Choose one option. The one that you believe. Okay, number two. Sylvia Plath's collected poems won the Pulitzer Prize 20 years after it was published, were written during the last year of her life, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1982, or were never published. Choose one option. Okay. And that way. Never. <laughs> never. Okay. So choose one option. And then that way you will be able to uh, measure your listening. Number three, Sylvia's husband made movies, died in 2003, was also a poet or had a movie made about him. Choose one option. 
And, and the last one is Susan Bassnett thought Sylvia's work was about her husband, wasn't very good, was about work life, was of great interest to women. I guess that we have two more questions. Let me see here. Did you choose the options already? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> oh, we have more. Let's see here. Sylvia's brother has was two years older than her, was born two years after her, was a professor at Boston University, or was a highly educated academic. Choose one option. Number six, Sylvia Plath's time at college was difficult because she got bad grades, she won a scholarship, boys didn't like her, she was short of money. In uh, number seven, in 1953, Sylvia left New York to get a job as an editor, rejected an offer to teach creative writing, worked as a guest editor in New York, or returned to New York because she was depressed. Number eight, what does the lecturer imply when she says, very few modern poets have captured the popular imagination as Plath. Plath was able to understand the hopes of ordinary people. Plath has become very popular. It is unusual for a modern poet to become popular with ordinary people, or Plath's writing was about modern people and their imagination. Choose one option. Okay, did you choose your options? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's see. Oh, we have two more. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> we have two more. Uh, it says, number nine, what does the lecturer imply when she says the domineering father figure became a common theme that record throughout Platt's writing? The image of her father appears in many of her poems. Platt's often wrote of her love for her father. Platt's writings were dominated by the image of her father, or Platt's father often told her what to write about. Choose one. And uh, the last one, which three sentences best summarize the passage? So you need to choose three. Letter A, B, C, D, E or F. Do you want me to write it? I'm sorry, do you want me to read it? Yes. Okay, letter A. What's remarkable about Platt's work is that it addresses many women's issues that were ahead of her time. B, Platt's father was one of her guiding influences and he supported and mentored her until he died in 1940. C, Platt's early life was spent living happily by the sea with her mother, who had a part-time job to support the family. D, the real significance and the greatness of work was never recognized within in her lifetime. E, Platt's academic path to success was secured by winning an early scholarship. After this, she never looked back. Or F, Platt's work reflects the many of the personal difficulties that she had whilst growing up and later as a wife and mother. Choose three of them. Okay, are you ready for the answers? Yes. Okay, ready perfect. Or <laughs> ready or not, you are going to have it, right? Okay, so number one, it was wow. the bell jar was her first novel, okay. her first novel. Number two, <laughs> Sylvia Platt's collected poems won the Pulitzer Prize in 1982. Three, Sylvia's husband was also a poet. Four, Susan Bassnett thought Sylvia's work was of great interest to women. 
Let's see the next one. Five. Sylvia's brother was born two years after her. Six. Sylvia Platt's time at college was difficult because she was short of money. Seven. In 1953, Sylvia worked as a guest editor in New York. Eight. What does the lecturer imply when she says very few modern poems have captured the popular imagination as much as Platt? It is unusual for a modern poem to become popular with ordinary people. Nine. Uh, what does the lecturer imply when she says the domineering father figure became a common theme that recurred throughout Platt's writing? The image of her father appears in many of her poems and the ones correct ones here were A, D, and F. <laughs> okay, it was good. How many of you had 10? 10. What was the on this? No one. No one. No one teacher. And nine? Nine? No. Eight? No. <laughs> Eight? No. Seven? No. no one. No. Seven? Six? Have you have seven? Seven. <laughs> yeah. seven. Okay, so seven is good. Seven is good. Seven, six, five, six. You got six. Okay, perfect. So six five is good, you see? Five. <laughs> five. Okay, five is good also. So you, you just That's need to five. practice a little bit more. What do you think is the problem? What do you think is the, is the problem? It's a lot of information because you take notes, right? Do you take notes? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. So if you take note, what do you think is the problem? The, the vocabulary? Is the vocabulary? The vocabulary and the, and the, the fast. Vocabulary. The fast. The vocabulary uh, and they are fast, right? Yes. Fast exactly. talking. So you know, we need we need to we need to uh, listen to a lot of uh, listenings in regular speed right in normal speed we not fast to agudize. yes because correct to say agudize. through the dice yes <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's good but we need to listen to uh, regular english right because when we are learning english in the books the conversations are really slow right hi how yes. are you mm -hmm. fine thank you and you uh, mm -hmm. buddy here or in normal life, it's like really fast. It's really fast, and they don't, yes. yeah, they don't understand what you're saying. Let's see. Do you want to do one more? Yes. 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 yes right. We still. Yes. I think that we still have time for one. Okay. If we don't, if we don't have the answers for the practice two, uh, we will check it tomorrow. Okay. Vamos a dejar en continuación. To suffer at night. To, to suffer. At <laughs> Dreaming night. with. Oh, what happened? What happened? So this is lecture two. This is shorter. It says, um, listen to the lecture about population growth. Population growth. Uh, we have six questions, okay? So uh, we are going to choose the best answer. We're going to play right now, okay? Ready? Yes. Okay. Yes, teacher. Good morning, everyone. Now, in today's lesson, I'd like to talk about population growth and, in particular, fertility rate. Now, can anyone here define fertility rate? Uh, is it the number of births in a population measured per thousand people per year? Oh, uh, no. That's what we call the birth rate, the number of children born in a year per thousand people. No, the fertility rate is the average number of children born per woman in her lifetime, that is, if she lives beyond her childbearing years. Now, do you think the British fertility level is higher or lower than it was, say, 20 years ago? I think it's lower, because these days women are far more focused on their careers than they used to be. Well, that point is certainly true, but actually, fertility levels in Britain are relatively high at the moment. In 2008, it was 1.96. That means that on average, each woman gives birth to 1.96 children, and in 2009, it was only slightly lower at 1.94. The last time fertility rates were this high was back in 1973. In the UK currently, the highest rate of fertility is in Northern Ireland, where the rate is 2.04, and the lowest is in Scotland, where the rate is just 1.77. I don't understand. How come fertility rate is going up? 
Women are just as career-driven these days as they were 30 years ago. Well, the reason is that during the 1990s, women really started to delay having families, and that was the reason for the decrease in birth rate then. Now those women are in their 30s and early 40s, and they are starting to have families. So that's why the birth rate is going up. Oh, I see. So it's not actually as if people are actively choosing to have more children than they used to. Yes, that's right, Charlene. The number of children per family is continuing to fall. Women who are currently in their 70s had an average of 2.4 children. Those in their 60s had 2.2, those in their 50s had 2.0, and the current figure is 1.9. Actually, this figure isn't due to more families choosing to have only one child, although that certainly is occurring. It's mainly because of the increasing number of women who have no children at all. This figure was 1 in 10 among the age group who are now 65. But now, one in four women in their mid-forties are childless. I heard that the fertility rate in Europe is, like, really low, 1.3 or something. That's right, Charlene, it is. It's far below the replacement level. Can you tell me what replacement level means? No? It's the number of births you need to keep the population constant. Yes, I heard that in France they're trying to get people to have more children. They even give out gold medals if you have eight. That's right. So we've already mentioned that women are waiting before having children because of their careers. Why else is fertility rate generally decreasing? I think they have fewer children because they're so expensive. I mean, I heard one report that said it costs 200,000 pounds a year to raise a child here. But I find that difficult to believe. People's standard of living is far higher now than it used to be a hundred years ago when families had eight or nine kids. That's very true. But these days people's expectations tend to be higher. Parents want their children to have the best opportunities in life, so they're prepared to pay to develop their children's talents. Yes, I heard that in China, where they're easing off some of the rules of the one-child policy and allowing some couples to have two, many parents are still choosing to have one. They say it's just too expensive. But, you know, I reckon that with all this parental micromanagement that's going on these days, parents only have the time to manage one or two children. That's a good point. So now I'd like to look at some different organizations and examine what they believe about the current population issue. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Now, okay, do you have the information, enough information to answer? <laughs> do you want Only to the main to idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> repeat, please please repeat. <laughs> okay, I will repeat it one more time. Okay, just one more time. Let's listen to it. Good morning, everyone. Now in today's lesson, I'd like to talk about population growth and in particular fertility rate. Now can anyone here define fertility rate? Uh, is it the number of births in a population measured per thousand people per year? Oh, uh, no, that's what we call the birth rate, the number of children born in a year per thousand people. No, the fertility rate is the average number of children born per woman in her lifetime, that is, if she lives beyond her childbearing years. Now, do you think the British fertility level is higher or lower than it was, say, 20 years ago? I think it's lower, because these days women are far more focused on their careers than they used to be. Well, that point is certainly true, but actually, fertility levels in Britain are relatively high at the moment. In 2008, it was 1.96. That means that on average, each woman gives birth to 1.96 children, and in 2009, it was only slightly lower at 1.94. The last time fertility rates were this high was back in 1973. In the UK currently, the highest rate of fertility is in Northern Ireland, where the rate is 2.04, and the lowest is in Scotland, where the rate is just 1.77. I don't understand. How come fertility rate is going up? Women are just as career-driven these days as they were 30 years ago. Well, the reason is that during the 1990s, women really started to delay having families, and that was the reason for the decrease in birth rate then. Now those women are in their 30s and early 40s, and they are starting to have families. So that's why the birth rate is going up. Oh, I see. So it's not actually as if people are actively choosing to have more children than they used to. Yes, that's right, Charlene. The number of children per family is continuing to fall. Women who are currently in their 70s had an average of 2.4 children. Those in their 60s had 2.2, those in their 50s had 2.0, and the current figure is 1.9. Actually, this figure isn't due to more families choosing to have only one child, although that certainly is occurring. It's mainly because of the increasing number of women who have no children at all. 
This figure was 1 in 10 among the age group who are now 65, but now 1 in 4 women in their mid-40s are childless. I heard that the fertility rate in Europe is like really low, 1.3 or something. That's right, Charlene, it is. It's far below the replacement level. Can you tell me what replacement level means? No? It's the number of births you need to keep the population constant. Yes, I heard that in France they're trying to get people to have more children. They even give out gold medals if you have eight. That's right. So we've already mentioned that women are waiting before having children because of their careers. Why else is fertility rate generally decreasing? I think they have fewer children because they're so expensive. I mean, I heard one report that said it costs 200,000 pounds a year to raise a child here. But I find that difficult to believe. People's standard of living is far higher now than it used to be a hundred years ago when families had eight or nine kids. That's very true, but these days people's expectations tend to be higher. Parents want their children to have the best opportunities in life, so they're prepared to pay to develop their children's talents. Yes, I heard that in China, where they're easing off some of the rules of the one-child policy and allowing some couples to have two, many parents are still choosing to have one. They say it's just too expensive. But, you know, I reckon that with all this parental micromanagement that's going on these days, parents only have the time to manage one or two children. That's a good point. So now I'd like to look at some different organizations and examine what they believe about the current population issues. Popul good morning. Okay, very good. Now you have the main idea, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Okay, more yes, or less. Yeah. Okay. We now try. We, have... we try to have it. We try. That's the important part. We're, we're trying. <laughs> now we're going to uh, read the questions, okay? Okay. Okay, let's see. Question number one. Which of the following is defined as the number of children born per 1,000 people per year? Replacement level, fertility rate, birth rate, fertility level. Choose one. Number two, which of the following countries in the UK has the highest fertility rate? England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Choose one. Number three, why is fertility rate in the UK higher than it was 20 years ago. Couples are choosing to have larger families. A higher proportion of women are having children. Women who delayed childbirth are having children now. Fewer women are interested in their careers. Mm -hmm. Four, what portion of women in their mid forties do not have children nowadays? 10%, 4%, 25%, 40%, 50%, 40%. And the last two. What do French couples who have eight children receive? A prize, a medal, money, or a house? And the last one is kind of difficult. Which of the reasons for low fertility rates is not mentioned? Women are increasingly focused on their jobs. People want to enjoy their lives before taking on responsibility. Parents do not have time to have many children. Children are considered to cost a lot of money. So which of the reason for low fertility rates is not mentioned? Choose one. Okay, now that you have chosen, we are going to check the answers, but it's time, I guess it's time to finish the class. So I will give you the answers tomorrow, okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> so you have, no. Uh, <laughs> give your, yes, give your, your answers. Podemos hacerlo diferido. Tomorrow, tomorrow. No, but be on time tomorrow, and tomorrow we will answer the questions. Okay. 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 Do you have any? Yeah. Do you have any question right now? Preguntas. All the questions. <laughs> all the questions. All the. Okay. A million of questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I will give you tomorrow the questions. Thank you for your hard work, and I will see you tomorrow. Okay. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a nice night. Bye. <laughs>